All right, so now that we understand what we're looking for an economy to achieve, we can start thinking about how we would go about modeling a prediction about how the economy could achieve those goals given uh, particular sets of policies which they may have at their disposal. So I think that the benefits of this video are actually uh, kind of diverse. So professionally, I think there's value in understanding how a simultaneous model actually works. And in class, we're gonna go over uh, a problem using this modeling framework and build a model using Excel, which is gonna be simultaneously determined. So it's gonna be something new for a lot of you at the same point in time. Uh, hopefully this will be an indication of how you can build models to create predictions given uh, exogenous, meaning given parameters. And we also wanna show that we can model the entire economy at once that we don't have to do it perfectly um, for it still to be meaningful. And it's really just a matter of how well we can do it. So we're gonna start off with a, a basic building block with this basic Keynesian cross model. And then we're going to discuss ways in which it can be improved and maybe consider uh, another improved model after we consider this one. And uh, finally, this is gonna give you a framework for understanding how we can study the potential impacts of economic policy which are obviously um, myriad throughout society and are discussed when it comes to politics, when it comes to how we improve people's lives through governmental action. So I need to start off by offering a disclaimer that no model is perfect and that even the best models in mac of macroeconomics failed to predict the Great Recession, that very few saw the housing crisis, financial crisis, and great recession coming. And for the most part, the mainstream of economics with our um, most sophisticated models did not see it coming. And without models, if anybody guessed that it was coming, it's kind of hard to tell whether they did so by, by luck or whether they actually understood the mechanisms by which it was created. And uh, what I want to also make clear is that even though the, the best models didn't see it coming, we're not even gonna study what the best models are in this class. That in general, we're gonna think that a lot of uh, macroeconomic models are gonna be dynamic, stochastic, general equilibrium models, which are gonna go way beyond the scope of this class, and that um, they're gonna be as mathematically intense as this page from a macroeconomics paper. In this class, we're pretty much just going to look at um, one equation for this model. And so it's not going to, to be nearly sophisticated, but that doesn't mean that there's not value in doing this. So a model doesn't have to be perfect for it to be informative. And this really reminds me of the set of quotes that have all, always um, I found very meaningful. And one of these is commonly known, right? the Italian proverb that we should not let the best be the enemy of the good. But really, we can, we can see that thread through different strains of economic thought. So John Locke was one of those classic philosophers that kind of verged on political philosophy, economic philosophy. Um, and he's famous, not famous for saying this, but has a, a quote which goes, the difficulty of doing perfect justice is no reason against doing as much as we can, which is similar to this quote that I really like by economist William Baumol, which says, but if we permit ourselves to be paralyzed by counsels of perfection, we may have still greater cause for regret. And so all three of these are getting at the common thread that just because we can't do something perfectly doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to do it. And just because the models in economics didn't perfectly predict everything that we observed doesn't mean that they're not still helpful for informing political policy and economic policy. And the same goes for the models we're gonna learn in this class. They're going to be limited in how versatile and how accurate they can be, but qualitatively, direction-wise, they're going to be informative and insightful and hopefully are going to allow us to get a better idea of how different types of policies uh, will impact outcomes which we care about, impact those three indicators of macroeconomics. 
So this first model that we're going to consider, which hopefully you've been uh, reading about in the appendix in the textbook, is the expenditure output model, which goes by a lot of different names that we'll probably use, such as the basic Keynesian model, the Keynesian cross model, the K cross model, and the multiplier model. So anytime we use any of these um, terms, we're going to refer to this the same model which we're going to cover right now. And this is the predecessor of the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model, uh, which we'll cover next week or perhaps the week after. And so while this model is, is a good starting point, this expenditure output model, it does ignore aggregate supply. So producers' decisions ignores the financial sector and the rest of the world. So no imports, no exports. So obviously those are going to be uh, simplifying assumptions and possibly even critical assumptions as well, which may impact the, the predictions from the model. However, uh, we can still make these comparisons ceteris paribus, holding all else equal and see what impact certain policies would have on prices, on unemployment and on growth. And so the goal of this model is going to be to identify short run equilibrium, real GDP, so the economy size in the immediate future by comparing how much is spent and how much is produced. So we're gonna um, return to this graph several times throughout the course of this video, but when I said that we're going to determine equilibrium based on how much is spent and how much is produced, we're gonna think of uh, production as being measured by real GDP. And we're gonna think of spending in the society as being measured by aggregate expenditure. And so we're then going to model an aggregate expenditure curve and see at what point the, here we go, see at what point the amount which is spent equals the amount which is produced. And so we're going to determine that by uh, finding where that aggregate expenditure curve, which measures how much we spend, crosses this 45 degree line. And the thing we know about 45 degree lines on an XY plane on a coordinate system here, a two dimensional coordinate system, is that at every point along this line, the X axis is going to be equal in uh, magnitude to the Y axis. And so when the aggregate expenditure curve crosses that 45 degree line, we know that the coordinates on that aggregate expenditure are such that real GDP is going to equal aggregate expenditure. Or in other words, the value of what's produced is the value of what is spent. And when we think back to our circular flow diagram of households and firms, remember that's how we know that the model is in equilibrium when the value of what is produced is being spent so that there's not any specific, well, there can be specific less, but there's not any general gluts, which is just another name for recession. And so we want to find that value. We want to be able to measure the size of the economy when we're in equilibrium. And importantly, if we deviate from that equilibrium, we need to know how much um, government intervention and of what type is needed to return to equilibrium. So since equilibrium is where desired spending equals production, we need to know what determines spending in an economy. And so this is where we are going to return to that consumption side equation, the demand side equation of GDP. So we're going to say GDP and we're going to say that equals Y in this model. It's going to equal C plus I plus G. Remember, we also had minus T plus X minus M. Now, there's a couple important uh, notes to make here. The first is that we've already said that we're going to abstract away. We're not going to consider uh, foreign markets or the rest of the world. So there's no exports. There's no imports. 
and we are only going to consider taxes as they directly impact consumption. And so in this model, we're gonna think of spending as C plus I plus G. And in the slides to follow this one, we're gonna start breaking each of these down and seeing how we can add them together to come up with an aggregate expenditure curve. So we're gonna start off with consumption because this is the most complicated term. And we're going to first lay out what it looks like and we'll return to it later and build it up, make it a little more complicated. So we're gonna think that consumption is partially autonomous, meaning that it's partially independent of other variables, and it's gonna be partially affected by disposable income. And so the part that is independent, the part that's autonomous is gonna be this C naught. And so C naught is going to be starvation consumption. It's gonna be the amount that households spend that is not dependent on income, that regardless of how much you make, you need to uh, have, an, you need to have housing of some sorts. You need to have enough uh, food to survive, enough shelter, enough water, that uh, if you're gonna continue to survive, there's a certain amount of spending that you need to do, even if it means you're, you're going into to debt, that you're spending more than you earn. The second half of this equation is going to be the consumption that does depend on income. And so that's going to be the CYD where, actually, let me uh, break that down a little more. So where C, this little c, is going to be the marginal propensity to consume, which we're going to think is uh, the percent of each additional dollar, which we are spending rather than saving. If we think that there's uh, two things that we can do with a dollar or a dollar of disposable income, we can either spend them or save them, then those two have to add up to 100%. So if our marginal propensity to consume is 0 0.9, then 0 0.9 plus the marginal propensity to save equals one, then the marginal propensity to save is going to equal 0 0.1. So it means that we're saving 10 cents of every extra dollar that we earn and we get to keep. And importantly there, that get to keep is uh, an important distinction that YD isn't just total income, it's going to be disposable income. And so we're going to return to what distinguishes disposable income and total income uh, in a couple, couple more slides. But for now, just keep in mind that part of consumption is autonomous, that survival consumption doesn't depend on income. The other part does depend on income and it depends on disposable income and what your marginal propensity to consume is. So graphically, this is gonna be upward sloping. And we can notice two features of the consumption function when looking at this graph. We notice that it has a positive vertical intercept that even if we make, uh, if we have zero in income, we're still spending a positive amount of money. And uh, yeah, so that, that's also important to note here is that this real GDP measures output, but it also measures uh, the total income or income for an individual or a group of individuals. And so this is going to be our C not, and the slope of this line is telling us how much our Y variable changes in response to a change in our X variable, which is our Y equals MX plus B. B is our C not, X is our YD, and m is our little c. And so the slope here is the percent of each additional dollar that we're spending. It's turning our x variable income into expenditure. 
So we can see those same features if we were to represent that information in tab tabular form instead of in graphical form. And first thing that we can notice here is that even when income is zero, we're still going to consume uh, that basic survival consumption of $600. And then we get savings by subtracting consumption from our income and our savings then is negative 600 as uh, we are spending $600 more than we earn. We can then also observe our marginal propensity to consume by looking at what happens when our income increases by $1,000, how much does our consumption increase? So if income increases by 1,000, consumption increases by 800, so this means of every $1,000 that we earn, 800 is going to be spent. And so we can simplify that down so that our MPC, our marginal propensity to consume, equals little c equals 0 0.8. And just to, to make sure that's true, we can see that as income goes up by 1,000, then savings goes up by 200. So our marginal propensity to save is 0.2. We add 0.2 to 0.8 and we get one. And that's important because we know that our MPC plus our marginal propensity to save equals one. Now the second variable in our calculation of our expenditure function is going to be I for investment. Now remember, once again, that investment is not savings. It's not uh, going to be investment in a stock market or investment in a, a portfolio or mutual fund. It's going to be investment by firms, spending by firms, which we want to think of as P&E, so plant and equipment. And so in this model, we're going to think that investment is going to be assumed to be influenced by market perceptions and interest rates, but not income. So that if we think back to our supply and demand model for uh, financial capital, and we think about what is going to uh, determine the uh, supply and demand curves, that neither of those are going to be impacted by income, but that uh, they're going to be impacted both the quantity of loanable funds is going to be impacted by interest rates and by uh, perceptions about the, the market pertaining to the future and to how uh, future market conditions relate to the business climate in the present time. And so because investment, because I, does not depend on, on income, it's going to be independent, then it's going to have a slope of zero. And so we're going to see that by it's just having a completely, I don't know why I tried to trace this with my pen, a completely horizontal um, flat curve to it. We're gonna make the same assumption about government expenditures as well, that they are not going to be a function of income. The government spending is going to be driven by politics, which party is in power, and how much government spending is going to factor into the, the desires, the goals of the political party in power. And taxes are not going to enter through this government spending. As we said earlier, taxes are going to enter this model through the consumption function. And so government spending is also not going to depend on income, so it's going to have a slope of zero and be flat as well. And so for every level of GDP, we're going to say that government spending is, is constant, and it's only going to vary based on political parties and uh, political needs. Now, as we just indicated, taxes are going to enter not through a separate term, but through the consumption function. And so when we think about the difference between consumption before taxes 
and consumption after taxes, obviously we're going to be able to consume less. We're going to be able to spend less uh, after taxes are taken out of our income. However, this isn't going to be a parallel shift that we're going to think that taxes take more out the more that we earn. And so we can incorporate that in a couple different ways. Uh, it could be taking progressively more out the more we earn, or it could be just taking proportionately more out the more that we earn. And so in this model, we're going to think of it as being a proportionate tax rate. So T is going to equal tax rate and is just going to be a, a percent of income which is collected by the government. So this may, for example, be 30% of each additional dollar that you earn may be uh, not available for consumption because it's going to the government. So this is what that same information would look like in tabular form instead of graphical form. We can see that uh, now when income increases by $1,000, first of all, we still have the same basic C0, the same survival consumption. Uh, but now when income increases by $1,000, we are not um, being able to make consumption decisions off of that 1,000, we're making consumption decisions off of the after-tax income. So we take taxes out first, and then we say for an extra $700, we're going to spend $560 there. And so this is going to be a lot easier once we look at the third representation of this information so we've seen graphical, we've seen tabular, and now we're going to look at uh, this information in equation form. Actually, before we do, let's just see what all of these curves, what C plus I plus G all combined would look like to form the expenditure function. And so if we have a consumption look like this, we have investment look like this, and we have government spending also be flat, then we add each of these together and this just leads to a parallel shift in C, we're just increasing the, the intercept, adding I and G to C not our survival consumption. And then uh, we have this aggregate expenditure, which equals C plus I plus G. And then we can use that to see where it intersects the 45 degree line and find our equilibrium.